Hey everybody, I just think it's really important that I at least talk through chapter 16 and chapter 18 with you uh, to make sure that we've covered all the big ideas that are going to be on the AP test. And also, chapter 16 it has a lot of economics, and a few of you are in economics, but some of you aren't. And I think this is just really important material regardless if it's on the test or not. So please read chapter 16 and watch both the part one and part two videos. In the second week, uh, read chapter 18 and watch the part one and part two videos. So let's get started. Economic and social welfare policy making. So the first part is identifying the main policy tools that American government uses, employs, to address economic problems and contrast the Keynesian and the supply side economics. So let me just spend a little bit of time with the basics. What's economics? It's the study of how people use scarce resources. That's really all it is. It's the fact that we don't have enough for the demand. We don't have enough for our wants. So all economies uh, have three core issues they have to resolve. What, how, and for who. What to produce with our limited resources. How to produce the goods and services we select and for whom, who should get these goods and services. So the economy is the grand sum of our production and consumption activities. The core problem in this is scarcity. We cannot have everything we want. So every time we choose to use a scarce resource in one way, we give up the opportunity to use them in another way. That's opportunity cost. So who, what, um, and how are really important. Uh, who, what, and for whom are the core issues. So who decides what to produce? Who decides how to do it? Who decides who can have it? Is it the free market? Is it the government making decisions? And when you begin to really analyze these questions, you can begin to understand the economic system that is actually in use in a society. Uh, back in 10th grade history, we spent a lot of time talking about capitalism, socialism, communism. Now, the United States economic system really operates under capitalism. However, there's a lot of government intervention, and a lot of that is contributing to the fact that we have a mixed economy. Globalization, the interconnectedness of all of our economies, has dramatically affected the structure of the U.S. economy. And the economy is dominated by multinational corporations, businesses like Disney, Coca-Cola, Microsoft, Apple, who have vast holdings in many countries. And it's characterized by the flow of products among all of these regions. If you think back to AP Human Geography, we talked about all the interconnectedness of these international businesses from the point where it's produced and it's shipped and it's stored and it's distributed. Um, this might make a little bit more sense. Um, capitalism is, is the way to go. Um, this is the goal that we should have as a society, is the free market. And I like this cartoon because it shows capitalism where bread lines wait on you versus socialism where you wait in bread lines. Socialism and capitalism takes away the free will of the people and it takes away incentives and it creates poverty. All right, so let's get a little bit more into this This fancy terminology in economics, fiscal and monetary policy. So fiscal policy refers to taxing and spending and borrowing of the national government. Governments try to stimulate the economy by taxing and spending and borrowing. Uh, and this is really Keynesian economic policy. Monetary policy refers to the decisions regarding the supply of money in the economy, including your private borrowing, your interest rates, and banking activities. Um, so the Federal Reserve really controls a lot of the monetary policy, the supply of the money. Uh, they also uh, really control interest rates. All the interest rates are really set primarily by the Federal Reserve system, and that becomes the basis of the other banking systems. If you're paying attention to all the different things the government's doing right now to prevent the economy from uh, going into a depression, they're using uh, both monetary and fiscal um, policy. Uh, which is really dangerous. Uh, fiscal policy, um, higher or lower taxes, higher or lower government spending. Monetary policy is the selling of treasury securities, the buying of securities, increasing the reserve ratio or how much the banks have to keep in reserve, inc increasing or decreasing the discount rate, uh, which is the base interest rate that Federal Reserve charges banks and then banks market up a little bit more 
to loan money to us. Right now, the Federal Reserve's interest rate is almost zero. Uh, and, and that can be a really dangerous place to be. I don't want to get too much into that, but there's a good video link here by Milton Friedman about monetary policy. And you can also look up about John Maynard Keynes for Keynesian economic policy or fiscal policy. Um, so here's some definitions, principles. Uh, you might want to pause and just kind of digest this and add a little bit to your notes. Another great slide, you might want to pause and take a little bit of time talking about fiscal policy and monetary policy that's used to expand an economy or used to slow it down because we don't want the economy growing too quickly either. Some funny cartoons for you, kind of where we are right now. And I mentioned the Federal Reserve. Uh, here is the system of the Federal Reserve System. These are non-elected people. Um, and they hold a lot of power. The Federal Reserve System was created uh, in 1913 under Woodrow Wilson as far as the U.S. Central Bank as we know it today. Um, there are Federal Reserve Banks um, here in Western Pennsylvania. We're part of the fourth area based out of Cleveland. Uh, the other part of this, you know, the eastern part of the state is based out of Philadelphia. And you can see where the 12 banks are located. If you take a look at your money, you'll see numbers on your money that will show you where that was actually printed, distributed from. Um, what do you know about the health of the economy? Um, how do you know if the economy is, is healthy or not healthy? Uh, there are some indicators that we talked about back in 10th grade history. In fact, I just made a, a lesson back from Chapter 21 for my honors kids right now on the 1970s economic issues. And the first thing that we use as proof of where the economy is is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Uh, and this is basically a built-in deflator. It helps us compare the price of goods over time um, accounting for inflation so we can begin to compare the price of apples in 1974 to apples in 2014. It measures the market basket of 300 specific goods that consumers purchase, homes, clothes, bread. Um, and so a CPI of 188.9 in 2004 to 195.3 in 2005 means there's a 3.4 percentage increase, if you will, in the cost of goods. And it's considered a good measure of inflation because it's tied to what everyday people buy. And, and Social Security payments, union wages tend to be tied to CPI. Um, give you just a random example, in January 2012, the CPI went up 0.2%. And so Social Security uh, would, you know, would oftentimes follow this inflationary level to make sure that the amount of money that people are getting is, is steady based on the cost of goods. And here are some lists of things in the CPI. You can pause it and take a look at that. Uh, probably the most well-known and useful indicator, though, is GDP. And we've talked a lot about GDP and GNP in our AP Human Geography class. We talked about GDP back in 10th grade history as well. But GDP is the total market value of all goods and services produced in a country in a given time period. We tend to measure GDP by the year, bringing it down into the quarter. Right now, if you're paying attention to the economy, uh, the first quarter just ended in March. We're going to get some numbers for the GDP in March, considering the economy started to slow down in March with a lot of the closures and, and our shutdown because of COVID. We're expecting the second quarter, the next four months, beginning here at the end of March and into April, to be perhaps negative GDP because our economy has slowed down so much. Um, so the GDP is really the most well-known and useful indicator. It includes own, only final goods and services, only things produced within America. Inflation can distort GDP. So you want to pay attention to whether people are using nominal GDP or real GDP. Real GDP means they've adjusted for inflation to make constant dollars. That's a better measurement. Um, and you know how we can use statistics to really skew information. You really want to look carefully when you begin to see people talk about GDP. And a lot of times it's adjusted a few months after the quarterly reports comes out to become real GDP. And sometimes it's adjusted to look better. Sometimes it's adjusted to look worse based on inflation. It does not account for population changes. We'd see that in per capita. Um, it's constant price, but there can be a change in quality. Maybe the price stays the same, but it's a smaller amount of chips in the bag, or perhaps it's made out of cheaper materials like plastic as opposed to metal. It doesn't account for used goods, but it's still the best indicator of what the U.S. economy produces each year. 
So here's a snapshot of GDP from 2007 to 2010. 2008 was our major slowdown. Um, a lot of the 2020 economics, uh, as far as where we are right now, is being compared to 2008. And they're saying it's going to be worse in 2008. Look at all those negative bars, right? Those are all those negative declines. When you have more than two quarters in a row of negative GDP, it's a depression. They call this the Great Recession because depression makes us scared. But in this, we can see this is this is a bad period in our economy. We recovered a little bit, but it, it took us a long time. It wasn't really until about... 2012, 2014, into 2016, we begin to see a positive upward movement of the economy overall. Um, unemployment, right now unemployment's bad because people are being laid off because businesses are being shut down. But there's different types of unemployment. Um, in order to be unemployed, you have to be over 16, already be working, um, and, and not able to work. In the sense you had a job, but you got laid off from it and you're trying to find one and you can't. This doesn't include discouraged workers and it doesn't include unmotivated workers who are just laying on their mom's couch who don't want a job. The unemployment rate only counts those who are actively trying to get a job and can't get one. Uh, and there are four major types of unemployment, frictional, seasonal, structural, and cyclical unemployment. Frictional is temporary, it's unavoidable, like you change job or you just graduate from high school or college and you're waiting to get your first job. Seasonal is that maybe, you know, maybe you're a waiter and you work in a, in a winter resort and, and so in the summer you're laid off. Or maybe you're a construction worker in November and December you get laid off because there's not so much construction being done during those months. It's seasonal, it's expected. Structural is there's jobs available, you don't have the skills. We saw this for a period of time when the steel mills and the coal mines were closing down in western Pennsylvania. You had workers who had skills, but not for the jobs available. And so this lag of skills is really the is is um, you know um, a, a bad thing for you know like middle aged men and women who are out of a job that just doesn't exist anymore. They don't have the skills for another job. So a lot of times the government will sponsor uh, payments for you to go back and get training or, or learn how to do the jobs that are actually in demand. The biggest portion of structural unemployment though is actually high school dropouts. You're not a whole lot you're qualified for if you're a high school dropout. So you tend to be structurally unemployed. You don't have the basic skills for the jobs that are available. And the next is cyclical. And this is when the whole economy has a wide shortage of jobs. And this is a recession phase with rising unemployment. And a lot of what we're seeing right now is going to be cyclical unemployment. Where there's a lot of shortages of jobs because the government has mandated that things are shut down. Um, pause your computer here for a, mi uh, for a minute and go through these different scenarios and make sure you can get the answers. Um, full unemployment doesn't mean that there's not any unemployment, but it basically means that the natural rate is the actual rate. Um, there, are, there is such thing as underemployment. These are people who are not working and are, um, are actively seeking a job. Um, people who would like to work but have given up looking are people who are working part-time because they can't find a full-time job. Um, so you know, maybe someone has a, a really great degree but there's no jobs available for their education. And maybe you, you got a master's in instrumental music and it's a wonderful uh, knowledge degree but there isn't a job for you. Maybe you got an undergraduate degree in history. What do you do with it? Um, there's not a whole lot you can do with just an undergraduate degree in history. You need to go on and get your master's or your doctorate to be a professor or actually focus in a higher level master's and doctorates to become a curator in a museum. Uh, and so there's a lot of underemployment in the economy as well. Maybe you went to school to be a teacher and there's no jobs right now. You just graduated and there's not job openings and so you're subbing, you're working, but you're underemployed. And I know I went through that really quickly uh, as our first part of chapter 16. I do have some video links here for you. There's some really great crash course videos on economy, the market economy, on monetary versus fiscal policy, the Federal Reserve, why America is so wealthy and so efficient, and what caused the economic boom of wealth. So please check a few of those out as you read through. Um, and I think that this will be really useful to make connections to the stuff we've learned over the last few years. All right. Thanks, everybody. Don't forget to watch part two of chapter 16.